Hello, hello, and welcome to the show. Oh, I made a rhyme. I'm Liz, joining you as usual from Central Virginia and the unceded lands of the Monica Nation. And I am really grateful that you're here with us today. Um, so first, if you want to know whose indigenous lands you're residing on, check out native-land.ca. I will put that in the show notes. Um, and this is a really cool map. And I thought initially when I looked at it, it was just a map of North America. Um, but it actually covers the entire earth, which is pretty cool. So check it out. Um, second, if you've been along for the ride with me here on this podcast for a while now, or you're brand new, and you want to learn more about this wonderful world of the sacred feminine, either way, you can check out my book, Home to Her, Walking the Transformative Path of the Sacred Feminine from Womancraft Publishing. And I will put a link to it in the show notes. And if you think you might want to purchase it, I hope you will consider buying it directly from Womancraft because it's an amazing woman-owned small business. Or you can order it from your local independent bookstore. And if you've read it and you enjoyed it, well, then, hey, I would love to know what you thought. I am super grateful for your favorable reviews, especially on Amazon and Goodreads. And I'm also just grateful for your emails, your DMs on Instagram, Facebook, wherever. I just like hearing from you. So please do reach out. And the same goes for this podcast. If you like it, please take a moment to leave it a favorable review or rating. Reviews on Apple Podcasts in particular are especially helpful, but I'll take them anywhere. And one last thing, this episode and almost every episode since 2022 is available on my Home to Her YouTube channel. Hello, if you're watching us. If you're not, um, you'd prefer to watch this conversation instead of just listen. Or if you know anybody who's hearing impaired and wants a way to access the show, then please send them on over to YouTube. And I'll put that in the show notes as well. And with that, away we go. So some of the guests that I am most honored to have here on the show are those women who started walking the path of the sacred feminine quite a while before I did. And it's not just because of the depth of their wisdom, which is substantial, but it's also because I can only imagine the environment in which they might've been working. <laughs> um, if I've ever felt like I'm going against the grain, exploring this topic in the 2020s, <laughs> which let's be honest, sometimes I do then I, I think it must have been super hard to do this work um, in the decades preceding. And if you've listened to the show for a while, then you've probably heard me discuss this very thing with some of the amazing women who are really the forerunners of this work, like Max Deschoux, who runs Suppressed Histories Archives, or Vicki Noble, who's another amazing pioneering researcher, Joan Marler, who's an editor and close collaborator with the archaeologist uh, Maria Gimbutas. I consider these women to be our collective foremothers, and I know that any work I've been able to do has been built on this solid foundation that they created. So I've got another one of those luminaries joining me today, and for those of you listeners who reached out and told me I really need to have her on my show, guess what? I heard you. It's happening. <laughs> so let me introduce her to you. Glennis Livingstone has been on a goddess path since 1979. She is the author of Pagayan Cosmology, Reinventing Earth-Based Goddess Religion, which fuses the indigenous traditions of old Europe with scientific theory, feminism, and a poetic relationship with place. This book was an outcome of her doctoral work in social ecology, and her newest book is A Poesis of the Creative Cosmos, celebrating her within Pegayan sacred ceremony, which synthesizes much of her work over the years. Glennis has facilitated seasonal ceremony for decades, taught classes, and mentored apprentices. She's also the author of the children's book, My Name is Medusa, and co-editor of the anthology Revisioning Medusa, From Monster to Divine Wisdom. Glennis has contributed to 11 other anthologies, including Goddesses in World Culture, which is edited by Patricia Monahan, Four Mothers of the Women's Spirituality Movement, edited by Miriam Robbins, Miriam Robbins Dexter and Vicki Noble, and Goddesses in Myth, History, and Culture, edited by Marianne Beavis. I hope I'm saying that right, Glennis. You can correct me in a second if I didn't. And Helen Hysook Wang. Glennis is originally from Australia. She's joining us today from her home in Southeast Queensland, Australia, Waka Waka country. Glennis, it is such a joy and an honor to have you here with me today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. It's lovely to be with you. Yes. Well, we have much to talk about. Um, 
Yeah, much. So we're going to, yeah, we'll just do the best we can here. When I was thinking about questions, I was like, oh gosh, this interview could be hours long, but we're just going to, we're going to see what happens and we'll do the best we can. Um, yeah. But I love to start with my guest is hearing a little bit about your spiritual background and what it was like growing up. And, um, you know, listeners who've been, you know, with this, with me for a while know that I enjoy hearing about that. Well, I'm just kind of curious, first of all, but also it seems like a lot of times many of us did not grow up with any presence of the divine feminine in our lives. So I'm always kind of curious about those early moments and what, what you kept, what maybe you tossed aside and, and how that all played out for you. So I'd love to start there if that's okay with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I recall in the, in the nineties writing a, an essay, uh, early nineties, um, called the way the cosmos was the way the cosmos was for a white Protestant child in country Australia. And, uh, it was definitely um, where God the Father ruled, you know, mm. and uh, he was no poet. <laughs> <laughs> he was no poet. <laughs> He's a um, judge, wasn't he? Like a lawyer or yeah, something yes. like that. Yeah. So you know, I, and and I was a, I was a very you know we went to a Sunday school every Sunday, but you know, I, in in a way, I was kind of blessed because it was a bit of a mix up. It was a Salvation Army Sunday school, a Presbyterian Sunday school. And I even took communion, I think there and, oh, but then I became a Catholic. That's right. When all my friends were leaving, when I was about 17, um, I joined because I was a very religious young thing. And um, they seemed like they were the only ones who were really serious around where I was anyway at least you know there were maybe Hindus or other people other than somewhere else in the world but the Catholics were you know serious so I thought oh well I'm serious so you know I'll join up mind you it was a bit of a shock the first time I went to a confession and he talked to me in Latin I was like I was freaked out like ah what's this so I knew I didn't go along with everything but you know I turned up to my what was it what do they call it, you know, when I got, you know, into the church anyway, and uh, I was, you know, totally in hippie gear, you know, <laughs> I had my hippie hat on and my hippie things and my, you know, looked like, you know, nobody else around me dressed like that. Um, but that's what, that's where I was. I was very much a hippie, you know, um, and when I, you know, went to teacher's college then, the big city, um, I used to hand out Jesus papers on the street corners, you know, I was one of those. <laughs> <laughs> wow went to the jesus coffee shop we had a coffee shop and uh, in the city but um something happened yes and, and it was really when i was first pregnant it was the epiphany the epiphany of being pregnant single alone i went away because you know you weren't supposed to be pregnant so nobody knew not even my mother well and only very close. Um, anyway, so there I was alone in the world, pregnant, blah. And I had this, I was sitting in a church as I always did. And I had this moment of like, what if the deity was female? Hmm. And I just knew that it would all be different. And so that was an epiphany. And, you know, I wrote to my then partner and said, oh, we could do this differently. We could do it differently. And he just thought I'd gone mad and <laughs> threw that in the bin. But I think I got the idea. It took me, I only recently realized when I saw Helen Reddy accepting, Helen Reddy who, who sang that song, I Am Woman, mm -hmm. I'm Strong, Australian. And when I saw her accepting, her acceptance speech for, a, for a, a, an award for that, she used the female metaphor, her or she. And it took me, I only realized that reason. Oh, I, th I think that's where I got the idea from. Oh, she for God? Like she used. Yeah. To, yeah. She's yeah. She for God. And, and so there was this epiphany for me in 1974, sitting in a church in Melbourne, that was really the crack in my cosmic egg. Hmm. Um, but it wasn't until like about four years after that, in 1978, when I was in Berkeley, California, sitting in circle at the Centre for Women and Religion at the Graduate Theological Union um, and with Rosemary Radford Ruta. And then I first heard the word goddess, really, hmm. uh, or, you know, that I remember consciously. And then it was reading Star, uh, oh, no, it was Mary Daly. 
that's what it was, Mary Daly, Beyond God the Father. And that would have been early 79, something like, something like no, it was earlier than that, early 78. Um, and that blew me out of the water, really, mm -hmm. or into the water, uh, it, realizing that the language that I was using every day what was the problem. And uh, so that was, that really radicalized me and just, but I didn't really, really leave Christianity until 1979 because I, I you know, I was in the left wing kind of avant garde version of Catholicism and we were doing all kinds of experimental liturgies. I did get liturgical training, you see. Mm -hmm. And I was also in Starhawk's first class in 1980, mm -hmm. it turns out. Um, but, yeah, so I sort of stuck with Catholicism for a little while, thinking, oh, you know, we can do radical things here, blah. But in 1979, I just decided, look, I've got, I've seen the best that it has to offer, and it's not good enough for me. You know, I'm out of here. So I jumped the fence. <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. And um, read lots of Mary Daly, her book, Gynecology. I was reading really radical stuff from people that you hardly know of these days. There was a group called Lux Madriana, the light of the mother, um, small group. So, and Woman Spirit magazines and were radicalizing me uh, in those early days. So yeah, I left, I really left it, jumped the fence in 79. Mm -hmm. And I want to go back to that moment of you, you know, realizing you're pregnant and if if the deity was female instead of male this would all be different like what did that mean for you at that time like was there I'm mean, guessing there might have been shame right if you weren't married and you, you find oh, yourself pregnant yes. or yeah yeah well you know I had to be hidden right I had to be yeah. away yeah amongst people I didn't know um and, and, you know, in a way that, that I'd been taken under the umbrella of the, the, the Catholics who were uh, against abortion. I didn't really know that. It was, you know, but because I decided, I had decided to keep, the, to adopt the child out. Mm. Um, that was already a decision I'd made that uh, I couldn't handle abortion because in my mind, that he was a love child. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wouldn't do that. Uh, so I was going to adopt him. Um, but to realize that the female, the deity would, was female, somehow I think in my mind, it was clear to me that it wouldn't have to be hidden. You know, there was no, there would have been no problem with sharing the whole yeah. thing with the world. Yeah. And, and just getting on with it, you know. Mm -hmm. And if I needed help raising the child, the help would be there. You know, I wasn't a great, I knew I wasn't a great, you know, I couldn't handle it really. I wasn't a great mother. I didn't have much skill. But you know, there would have been a community. Yeah. Yeah. I had read Children of the Dream by Bruno Bettelheim, I think. Oh, no, I hadn't read it by then. No, I hadn't read that yet. And I hadn't yet read Immaculate Deception by Suzanne Arms, but that was a book I did read after this. Immaculate, what did you say? Deception? The Immaculate Deception, mm -hmm. Suzanne Arms. Okay. Way back there. <laughs> I'm writing all this down. So if you're listening, I'm going to put it in the show notes <laughs> so you can look these up if you're curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but anyway, I think it was that, you know, everything, it, it would have been, there would have been a community. It, there was no, there was no problem with it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and interesting though, that it took you, sounds like several more years to really fully embrace that. And I'm wondering you know, you said you were reading a lot, but was there anything in, was it kind of the culmination of that or something that sort of tipped you over to say, because I, I know for me, when I started learning, I, I came out of a conservative Christian background. And even though um, I had been questioning that for a long time, I, you know, I think I kind of secretly hoped I would like make my peace with it so that every, it would just be easier. It'd just be so much easier if I could just fall in line, you know, like my family would be happy, everybody be happy. And, and then when I realized absolutely not, this isn't going to work, I, I still would say that it took years to be like, this is okay. It's okay for me to take this step away. And I'm wondering, you know, how that kind of played out for you. Yes. Well, I think, um, 
And I think Sonia Johnson writes a little bit about this, and you know, because she was, um, I think it was Mormon or something. But you know, when I first thought about leaving Christianity, I was kind of afraid that something bad was going to happen. <laughs> yes. to you know, and so it, it, I did have to come to terms with the fact that look, this is really, you know, a, an era of, you know, and I, you know, Starhawk. I was reading Starhawk, so that was definitely helpful. Um, yeah, so there is sort of like facing the like, oh. You're going against, you know, some kind of ultimate reality. And then you have to realize that, you know, I'm not going against some kind of ultimate reality, that he's just a metaphor. This is just a metaphor. And it's a, you know, and, and, and patriarchy, the, the, this religion has risen and it will fall. You see, you can sort of work that out in your brain. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm out of here. And what, you know, nothing bad happened. Here I am. <laughs> I'm, in fact, I'm out in the open air, <laughs> having, making my own, I'm going to make my own party here now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. Well, and I love to know, you know, so I use the language sacred feminine. I'm, I would love to know if you want to use different language, like hold space for that, however you'd like to describe it, but you've, um, you know, you've now been on this journey for a while. And so, um, I don't know that I, I know it's a really big question to say, who is the divine feminine to you now or is sacred feminine to you now? But, but yeah, I mean, you don't know, we don't have to put a definition, but here at this point in your journey, how do you, how, what's your relationship and how do you understand that idea using whatever language you want to use? Yes. Language, language is a huge issue um, for many of us. And uh, I think, well, for a long time, and it's certainly in my first book, I use the word, I use the female metaphor because I understand goddess and God, both of those words are metaphor for some kind of you know, mystery or the, the great cosmos, um, some kind of ultimate absolute um, reality. So I used female metaphor a lot earlier. I know that's not very... Um, Cuddly, it's not a very cuddly name, but um, mm. that's what they all are, really. They just, it's metaphor because that's all we have to speak about this absolute. And yeah. I think, um, I think I like just the female metaphor, like her, mm -hmm. she, you know, her, celebrating her um, with a capital H. Mm -hmm. That is uh, simply, that is simple, really. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I've been able to story this absolute, uh, you know, in, well, I, I, the three qualities of cosmogenesis, you know, the three qualities uh, th that I speak of um, that I get from Thomas Berry and Brian Swim, Thomas Berry, really, it was his three qualities of the unfolding cosmos. Um, so he had three qualities of that ultimate reality. And, you know, I had these three qualities of the great goddess. You know, the Virgin Mother Crone is the, is the popular one. Mm -hmm. But she has three qualities. Uh, when I first thought about writing my PhD, I really had wanted to do a study of this trinity, this mm -hmm. female trinity. Um. And that, so that was a passion because, you know, I knew that the church fathers had written heaps and heaps and heaps tomes on the Trinity, you know. Mm -hmm. like, huh. So I really wanted to do a study of her and this, this Trinity, this original triplicity that, that, that runs through the cosmos. And Caitlin Matthews speaks about this triplicity that runs. And, and you know, it, it's in the Celtic traditions, the triskeel, the... Um, yeah, that's the triple spiral that you see so often yes, on the, the ancient the stones. The triple spiral, that's yeah. right. Um, and so then when, I, but I also was very passionate about the universe story. So I thought, oh, how am I going to, you know, the PhD must be bringing these together. I must bring these together. And so that's really what I did was, and bringing those three qualities of cosmogenesis, melting them into the three qualities of the goddess, expanded my understanding of her mm. and really storied her as the creative dynamic that unfolds the cosmos mm -hmm. as a metaphor for the creative dynamic that unfolds the cosmos 
in every moment, since the beginning and in every moment. So that's really kind of how I relate to her now. And to, to celebrate the seasonal creativity is a way of aligning myself with that cosmic creativity because that's how it happens in my place. Mm -hmm. However it happens in your place is the manifestation of this extant creativity that we're immersed in. Mm -hmm. So that's why I do what I do and I guess that's how I relate to her. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have many thoughts on that. Um, one thing that popped in my mind is you were you were using the word metaphor, you know, to as we approach this creative source. I was thinking that um, a few months ago I had a podcast guest on named Joy Layden, and she talked about, and she's a scholar of Jewish theology, and so she's written an amazing book of poetry called Shakina Speaks, um, giving voice to the you know the that that aspect of uh, the divine that's feminine in form and but she said something about you know whenever we are trying to understand um god s god etc god however we want to use that it's like looking out a window right and we look out the window and um we only can see what we can see because she's <laughs> she that source is it's just so big you know it's like how do we approach that in our in our bodies and in in our and so I, you said metaphor, and I thought, yes, yes. Like, and it, it made me think of, um, like, looking out the window of her. Like, that's what I like to look out. You know, like that feels like it, a a really powerful way for me to be in touch and closer to divine in that creative force. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> does that make sense? Yeah. To you? Yes, okay. <laughs> Oh, that's what, that's the best we can do, isn't it? The best yeah. we can do is to speak about this. <laughs> yes, I know. We fumble along. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say, and I wrote this down because I, I want, and I want to get into some of these terms for people who are like, what are we talking about when you say cosmogenesis? And I want to talk about Pegayan, you know, this, this um, term that you use and where it comes from. One of the things that I I made a note of in your book that I, I just really appreciated because you just stated it so simply, but matter of factly, is that reaching for a language is a power. It's a power, right? That it gives us power. The power to name is important. Um, and so I I thought of that as well when you were, you know, we're talking about language and using the metaphor of of she and that that claiming that is a source of power, which of course it is. I guess I hadn't really thought of it like that way. I, I really appreciated you. Um, putting that out there. Um, so yeah, I wonder if you could talk about, okay, so for people who are like, what do you mean cosmogenesis? Let's, can you define that? Like, uh, let's start there. <laughs> yeah. I, make sure I come back to that. I just want to say something on that language, you know, yeah. like the word spell, spelling, you know, mm. and it, mm. the language that we talk every day, there's a meta narrative. There's, there's a cosmology in what we say every day uh -huh. and you know good old Monique Wittig wrote Les Guerrières back in the late 70s and she said the language the words you're speaking uh, it's made up uh, the words are killing you so yes oh. spelling and wow. we need to spell we need to spell our word be conscious of what we're spelling and of course the great goddess Bridget the great Celtic uh, goddess Bridget um, she was a, a, a matron of uh, they often call her a patron, a matron of poetry, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. spelling. Yeah. Okay. So now back to cosmogenesis. Um, it's it's the unfolding of the cosmos, and it's based on there's an earlier scientific principle called the cosmological principle. But cosmogenesis is a relatively new development in science in terms of recognizing that we live in, in an unfolding, developmental, and unfolding, evolving universe. It's not static, you know, it, it's unfolding. So cosmogenesis is really the unfolding of the cosmos. Evolution, mm -hmm. if you like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it sort of includes a cosmology. It's not just, you know, some kind of um, objective fact. Mm -hmm. it's a recognition that we are in it mm -hmm. <laughs> we're mm -hmm. part of it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's cosmogenesis if that helps it does um what are the pegayan the word pegayan. Pegayan. yeah yes it's reaching for a new language uh, and um 
I had, I guess, since, you know, maybe since the 1980 or so coming across Starhawk, Starhawk's work, I was, I was grounded in Starhawk's work, you know, the spiral dance. It was, that's where I grounded myself after leaving Christianity. So Starhawk has been very important. And so, and she comes out of the pagan tradition, the old European, the old European traditions. Um, but, you know, when she came to Australia in 2003, and I was one of her hosts, and, and but I had already been identified really as Gaian, Gaian spirituality, which is where, what I really saw myself as more than pagan. And I got that term, I think, from Charlene Spretnak when she wrote a, an article, Gaian Spirituality, in 1991 in Woman of Power magazine. And it is referenced in, in the back of my new book. Um, so I had really identified as Gaian because mm -hmm. I knew that, you know, my spirituality had, was some grounded in science as well. Uh, so, so I said to my partner, I said, oh, we're standing in the kitchen. I said, oh, I, I really identify as Gaian, but, you know, um, I really come, I'm really, you know, practicing a pagan tradition. And he said, and it was him that coined the term. He said, what about Pagayan? <laughs> and I said, "Ah, oh, that's it. The lights went on. Mm. And I suddenly had a name for this. You know, I'd written my PhD and there were six lines to it. And I was trying to get this published. <laughs> it had six <laughs> lines to just explain what it was about. Uh, you know, can't do that. And so Pegayan was it. And then after I published the book, Pegayan Cosmology, which, you know, could get published because it had a name, um, <laughs> this young man from the UK gets in touch with me. I was very suspicious at first, but he said, look, he said, um, I registered the domain name pegiron.org, you know, a few months ago and, and then just left it. And then I just Googled it and found you and you've written a whole book on, on, on the word. It was a term that he had coined over there in the UK because he was searching for a word. To describe his spirituality. He said, so I think pegine.org is yours. You can have it. Wow. <laughs> but anyway, when I finally accepted him, and, and his name's Rob Blake, and he's mentioned in the first paragraph of the book. Um, yeah. So we were both reaching for the word, and we had both reached for the word, and then we met each other. Um, so that's Pegine. Mm-hmm. And, so, and of course, of course, Gaian, you know, brings it's a pagan tradition of practice, religious practice, um, with Gaian, which is an ancient name for goddess, mm -hmm. but also a new name for the scientific theory, the Gaia theory, by you know James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis. Yes, and can you say just a little bit of that about that for people who may not be familiar with what that is? Yes, yeah, so I do. Google, <laughs> look up the Gaia theory. Mm -hmm. James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis, um, very important, both of them. I, I think it was 1974, first developed the theory that the planet is alive, for heaven's sakes. Western science coming, <laughs> you know, recognising. So it was Western science recognising. So it he, he was very daring for him as a scientist to put forth this, you know, theory that the planet was alive. And and that was based on it's, it's complex, but you know so it's a bit hard to explain. And, mm -hmm. But just how it was, how the planet uh, kept the temperature at a certain, um, you know, moderate, despite the fact that the sun had was I think increasing in heat. Or but anyway, it, the, the 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 planet seemed to be self generous self-protective it took care of the temperature hmm. and, and and that enabled the whole Gaian science studying the planet as a whole because it did eventually it was a hypothesis at first and then it got accepted mm -hmm. as a theory and so it, that meant that other scientists could study the planet as a whole which we take for granted almost these days mm -hmm. yeah wow yes and I'm sure there were Indigenous people around the world rolling their eyes at science is figuring out that the planet is alive. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. yes. like, welcome yes. to the club yeah. uh, yes yes you finally western science made it <laughs> yay you finally caught up yeah um, yeah well you know when in the early days western science had to separate itself you know from yeah. the church so we could get on with its business yes that's true that's a really yeah that's a really good point mm. well and i i um I took some notes here, but one of the things, and you've already referred to this, like the, you know, the, the triple, the triplicity, um, present, but those, those three, um, those three pieces, I think that are, um, part of the story of the universe, right? I wonder if you could talk about those a little bit, which were the differentiation communion and autopoiesis, right? Could you speak yeah, to that's those? Very good. Yes, yeah. that's right. Um, yeah. And so there were terms identified by Thomas Berry, and I don't know how he came up with these three qualities, but in any case, differentiation, to be is to be unique. Everything is unique. So to be is to be unique, differentiated. To be a uh, communion, to be is to be related. We come into this world, we are already related from all the way back. There's no, there's no cutting of that scene all the way back. We are in relationship. So it gets communion. And then autopoiesis, that's often the tricky one, but to be is to be a center of creativity, basically. Mm -hmm. Autopoiesis, I love the word. When I first heard it, I thought, oh, that's such a nice word because it's, you know, self-creation. Uh, and the, the whole universe is self-creating, mm. self-generating, self-educating. Um, like parthenogenesis, right? Yeah, it's, it's a bit kin to that, yes. Yeah. Uh, parthenogenesis, that's right. Um, she's completely capable of reproducing herself. Mm -hmm. and, and has obviously done so since the beginning of time because that's, you know, where... Um, so the introduction, on that note, the introduction of meiotic sex was something that happened at 1.5 billion years, but creativity was obviously going on a long time before that. Mm. So gendered sex, meiotic sex, you know, which was introduced 1.5 billion years ago, and my and Brian Swim, the person I often refer to, says, well, that's why, you know, it causes us so much trouble because we're just new at it. Mm. <laughs> That was only 1.5 billion years ago. And, and um, I love that. And so I'm aware that the association of, you know, virgin mother crone, this triplicity, you know, it's, it's, um, it's one of the expressions of this creativity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure. So in that way, then if we related the maiden mother crone, virgin mother crone, um, autopoiesis is the crone. Is that, it's the, yes. 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 So, yes. Can you talk about that? Because that also goes to the, um, the connection to lunar cycles, right? And that there's so yeah. much ripeness in the dark. And I think this will lead us into the, the wheel of the year too, because I want I want us to put it all together of how like practicing these ritual and ceremony that honor the turning points on the wheel of the year, bring us actively into participating in this creative dance, play, act, whatever that, however we want to describe yeah, it. Yeah, when I, when I first, you know, I can remember the moment really sitting down, you know, okay, well, how am I going to put these these threes together, you know? Uh, yeah, well, virgin, um, maiden, and differentiation is obvious, you know, to be is to be unique. The love of self, you know, the individual, every being, beauty, the beauty and uniqueness of it. So that's obvious. It's connected to the virgin um, maiden self. Yes, and I, and I just want to say really quickly for those who are not, who are maybe new to this, like when we say virgin, we are, we are not referring to untouched by men. Like that's a, that's a patriarchal, you know, interpretation. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's got nothing to do with intact hymens. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's right. It's she who was unto herself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
that's right. Or her own agent, you know. Mm -hmm. So yes, thank you. Uh, so, and you can use the word young one if you like, but it's too. So that was an obvious, you know, differentiation and, and this young one, this um, unique self was obvious. And then communion, that's obviously the mother, you know, to be is to be related, to the love of other, you know. Mm -hmm. um, then autopoiesis, I thought, oh, okay. Crone, oh, it doesn't happen. Oh. Anyway, then I was like, oh, so it expanded my whole understanding of the crone, the old one. Well, the old one and being a center of creativity. It's like, oh, so it expanded my whole understanding. Well, of course, it's not, it's not uh, you know, the end of the line. It's a circle, you know. It, and what in the larger picture, the aging process is creative it's creativity at work it's like right because <laughs> we've got to roll over for that you know so the new one can come up you know mm -hmm. so it's roll over you know it's like that it's it's a process of um creativity as far as Gaia is concerned mm -hmm. in the bigger picture mm -hmm. so she is about creativity um autopoiesis to be as to be a center of creativity, and so yeah, the old one—that's what she—that's what she is about. Mm -hmm. hmm. And tell us the um, definition for the word poesis. Does that say it was a new word for me? And I just love how it sounds. I want to say it all the time now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Our poesis—it's the making of a world. Mm, the making of a world. Mm, beautiful. Making of a world, which is you know. Another goddess woman, when she recently heard the word because of the title of the book, she said, well, that's what we goddess women do. And it is, you know, we're about making a world mm -hmm. that, that we can inhabit, that we can be in, that we can be in, and that our children and the world can be in. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And I was just thinking, I don't know how, I'd love to hear you reflect on this. I was thinking of autopoiesis and um, the idea of eminence, you know, about the, um, which is a word that I've often come across as being associated with the divine feminine and goddess traditions in particular, that um, uh, as opposed to the God who sits on the um, cloud up in the high, up high, and like he made everything and now he's just going to sit down and look at you. And if you screw up some of his creation, maybe he'll yell at you if you're not doing it right. Um, but, but the goddess is, um, She's in just make the world. She is the world. She is in the world. She is in all the things. And so um, I guess autopoiesis makes me think of that too. Like, again, that kind of that indwelling presence of the divine in us. And so our, we are, we are creating at the same time. We are co-creating. We are in our, yes. and our creative process is divine. Does that, how that lands with you as well? That's, that's very good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, okay. I mean, Thomas Thomas Berry often changed the word autopoiesis because I think he may have thought, oh, it's a bit difficult. I don't know. He used to use the word subjectivity at first, so mm. it did change. So he used the word subjectivity and then he changed it to autopoiesis. But it is about the inner, yeah. you know, recognising that. Mm -hmm. um, the sentience that we are immersed in if you like that you know the, we live that's one of the things i do every morning is recognizing that i am sentient subject within the great subject mm -hmm. and, and that's a term of thomas berry's it's the great subject mm. he, he says we we um a lot of people think that the world is a, a collection of objects mm. but we live in a communion of subjects we mm. are a community of subjects Mm. Mm. yeah so anyway the poesis and, and, uh, and that was the other thing that I didn't say about you know the differentiation communion and autopoesis it it corresponded to the yoga mudra I was the way I was taught the yoga mudra which is uh, there's the love of self there's the love of other and there's the love of all that is 
And frequently the, the love of all that is gets left out of the picture as the crone does and as, you know, but yeah. it's, <laughs> I don't want to know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. And because in a, in a traditionally linear time, like you don't want to talk about the crone if you think that that's the end of the line, then everybody wants to stay away from that, right? Right. And, and Miriam Robbins Dexter writes about, in her book, Whence the Goddesses, you know, the, the patriarchy could use the virgin quality, you know, that, that that's kind of like stored energy is how she calls it. And it could use the mother energy, harness that one pretty well. But it didn't want much to do with the witch. The, you know, they diminished the, the crone to witch or hag and couldn't use that energy. Yeah. So it often gets left out for that, you know, in, in in the patriarchy, you know, they can deal with the beautiful young thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it can deal with the mother. We know how to deal with her. Yeah, well, you, you she's kind of <laughs> necessary, right, for your... And, and a book on that note that I read very early on was Adrian Rich's book, A Woman Born, Motherhood mm -hmm. as Experience and Institution. But, um, yes, but the crone energy, the old one, she got turned into the witch and the hag and something that you laughed at or was fit if you know um and and it all anyway the love of all that is often just gets left out of the picture mm -hmm. and you'll see that in groups you know that you you know maybe part of every day you know committees and whatnots you know, they'll allow everyone their individual word and then they'll sort of recognize the group as an entity but to recognize that you're part of something bigger as well at the same time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so tell us how this relates then, you know, like let's, let's pull that into this, um, the wheel of the year. And for those again, like, yeah, never really know who's listening. So might be helpful if you, you know, if you, if you don't know what the wheel of the year, if you already know what the wheel of the year is, you can just, you know, kick back and relax for a second. But, um, if you don't know what it is, I wonder if you could talk us through that, Glennis, like what that, what, what, um, what I'm referring to. Yeah, yes, the solstices and the equinoxes. Mm -hmm. You start there. I'm amazed how many people, when they say happy Christmas to me, I say, I don't do Christmas, I do solstice. Huh? What's a solstice? Mm. <laughs> so do if you don't know what a solstice is, do find out. Um, so it's based on the first of all, the solstices and equinoxes that our, our planet experiences. And then there's the cross quarter days. So those points that are, you know, halfway in between the solstices and equinoxes. So that makes eight. Mm -hmm. and now, not every Indigenous tradition, even in old Europe, I think, did all eight. But there are all eight uh, in different places and different. So I, I do all eight. And, and, and it's fairly common to do all eight uh, amongst the pagan tradition. So now, how do I relate? So, yes, how do I celebrate her in this wheel of eight? Mm -hmm. And yes. Three qualities. Yeah. yeah. So yes. there's three qualities. And I do have a map of my, you know, uh, which is in the new book, uh, my diagram, my map <laughs> of the territory. Um, but essentially, the solstice, the winter solstice, celebrates origins the birth of all, uh, out of the darkness, out of the full darkness. The first celebration of the young one then is Imbolc, early spring, and it essentially celebrates differentiation par excellence. That particular celebration is the beauty and uniqueness of each being and the dedication then to, to the nurturance and of that new of that young being that being that you are so it's a commitment to this self this particular self is possible in that and, and it's based in you know all kinds of pagan tradition but that's how i celebrate it and then spring equinox is a stepping into the power of that if you've nurtured that and dedicate yourself to the being it steps into power she steps into power uh, and, and that's inclusive for all, all beings at spring equinox. 
the green in green is 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 the power of green stepping into power and beltane is the celebration of her gradually coming into relationship the fertility uh, that kind of fertility, we're coming into relationship following her allurements uh, her, her desire, holy desire, I'm that which is attained at the end of desire. So desire, in a way, pulls the whole thing around. Mm -hmm. So it's a celebration of desire in its all its valencies. It sometimes gets diminished to some kind of heterosexual thing, but it's really much bigger than that. It's what gets us out of bed in the morning. <laughs> Mm -hmm. desire so it's a and so beltane high spring is a celebration of desire uh, her coming into relationship with this uh and then summer solstice is a celebration of the fullness of being uh yes the fullness and wholeness of being but then after the summer solstice, you see, and a lot of people switch off here because, oh, we don't like that. Uh, it's <laughs> you know, going into the dark. So it's the mm -hmm. new young dark and it's a welcoming of the dark because, you know, the, after the fullness of being, there's the passing of all. There's the passing. Yes. And we have to accept even the passing of the sun. So I, I story, Lamas is, for me, the quintessential celebration of, of the old one. It's a, it's a chance, an opportunity, especially in our cultural context, to celebrate her blackness, her darkness, her beauty in that. Uh, so I call it the sacred consuming. It, mm -hmm. it In a way, it, it, it's, and in pagan tradition, it's often Lunasa, the wake of Luke, the god, the sun yes. god. Because, um, but Lamas is my term for it because I think it's, it's which means the feast of the bread. A lot of people think that for that reason it's a Christian name, but I think the Christians just appropriated the name because they preferred Lamas to Lunasa. <laughs> mm -hmm. But so Lamas is the feast of the bread, it's a sacred consuming all of that being. That's its purpose. The purpose is to give yourself over. Uh, and, and that's one of the things about summer solstice, it, it's, it celebrates a radiance, which is a giving over of the self you the fullness and Starhawk writes about that too this cosmology is not about self-abnegation it's about becoming fully who you can be and giving that over so that's Lamas a quintessential celebration of the the first celebration of, of the dark and celebrating her uh her darkness and then uh Maybon, autumn equinox then as she as she descends is a celebration of the harvest, but also the grieving, mm -hmm. grieving the loss. And we feel it, you know, we feel it. The loss of the beloved one. All oh, right. Uh, so autumn equinox, and I base all the equinoxes on the celebration of Demeter and Persephone, the Eleusinian mysteries. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, autumn equinox was the greater um, Eleusinian mysteries. The, the loss of the beloved one. Uh, and then back into Sawin, uh, well, we, we haven't got there. It was really where it begins in Sawin, deep autumn, because that is, I think, in some ways, um, the dark is still increasing. It's the womb, it's it, uh, the conceiving of the new takes place. It's the breakdown, the compost, the old one. But that's where the old one becomes the face of the mother. Her face then changes because it's in that dark womb place that the new is conceived. The new can be dreamt up in, in that complete immersion and dis dissolution. So I often say that Lamas is a, uh, is a time for dissolution, but Sawin is a time for resolution, resolution. It's the conceiving that dark space provides. Mm. And then that's um, uh, known by a lot of children as Halloween, um, right? Yes. But, yes. but yes, and I also wonder if there's a connection. I want you to you know finish the, because we've got to get to the um, winter solstice too. But I, um, I was just thinking as you were saying that, that I think of that time for so many people, it's the um, approaching of the dead, you know, like the veils are thin and the dead are very close. And 
I was just thinking about, well, yes, of course they would be in a cycle, you know, but they're part of that creative process, right? They're coming forward to be part of the regeneration. Is that, is that how you see it and experience it? That, that's, yeah, that's very good, Liz. Um, yes, it it is a time for remembering mm -hmm. all that has passed. You know, I mean, there's the grieving, the loss at Autumn Equinox, and we express that. And then we move into, you know, all that has been lost and yeah. the ancestors and upon whom this present moment is built. Yeah. Yeah, so that's where, and, and we live really, they often say that the veils are thin that divides the worlds at, the, at that time. But really, the veils are always thin. Yes, I've, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Maybe we're just paying attention. Yeah, more. that's right. <laughs> so in and deep autumn is a really good time to be paying attention add to it because you know yes mm -hmm. the leaves are turning and falling and it's cold and it's dark and it yes so we just remember mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. all that's in the compost and having the vision to see see that that it's out of here out of this place that the new will be conceived mm -hmm. And that does bring us, you know, uh, there's debate about the new year, whether it begins at sowing or winter solstice. And there are some, you know, this, they argue backwards and forwards about, you know, um, it's not really good to argue. It's like, yes, um, it's like uh, it's like the fathers of the church arguing about when life begins. All right. <laughs> yes. yeah. uh, but so, you know, there's a conceiving mm -hmm. in sowing deep autumn and there's the birthing the birth of mm -hmm. all so you know it's all yes beginning and we do light the new candle we do light the new candle in in my tradition uh at winter solstice yeah hmm. well and i i know for myself you know when i started um paying attention to the wheel of the year it really was like it had like just a, a desire. And also my, my children are, especially when I started, they were younger and I wanted them to have that sense of um, the cyclical nature of life and, and these pause points to, to find reverence with them. And I was also totally overwhelmed. It was like eight of these. Oh my gosh. How do people, how do people do this? Like our world is not designed to, um, you know, uh, allow us to, you know, to, to have like a special family sacred celebration, like this often, I don't even know how to do that. Um, and so, and I love, cause you say this in the book, I feel like you, you put it in the book towards the end about the significance of, of walking all of them together, like understanding that cycle as a whole. And I just want to say, and I don't know how you feel. I'd love to hear your response to this, Glennis, but I was like, okay, I got to start where I can. And the first one that was just so clear that I needed to do for myself was the winter solstice. Like that is just the pure most match. I love the dark. I love it. And, um, so honoring that one and celebrating that one. And it was very clear how I could do that with my family and my children. And they're already primed because they know Christmas and they're already out of school. Um, for the most part for that holiday. And so it just adds to the magic of the season. And so we started as a family there. And then I, um, you know, would add like the, the Samhain and, or Samhain, uh, and then I would, um, and then in bulk yes. came online and it's sort of, been like <laughs> they've each, it's kind of like they're unfolding themselves to meet me where I am. And so I just want to say if anyone's listening, you're like, I want to get on board and I don't know how, like, maybe start where you're feeling called, yes. like where you're feeling like what feels really resonant to you. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, that's really good advice, Liz. Certainly, that's how the universe speaks to each of us. Yeah. You know, you follow your passion, what draws you, and that's the first step, yes. And winter solstice is really, in some ways, uh, one of the most obvious places to begin because there is such a big thing about Christmas it was only after I first experienced Christmas in the Northern Hemisphere that I really got the connection. Yes. <laughs> because, you know, Christmas here in Australia is in summer. 
Oh, yes, of course. Right. Because, you know, it doesn't make any sense. As I say in Pagan and Cosmology, it was the religion, the, the Jesus God religion in Australia, in the Southern Hemisphere, is probably the most alienated religious that that Gaia has ever known because it had no relationship with place. So when I first experienced Christmas in the Northern Hemisphere, I thought, oh. Yes. Yes. So when I got back to Australia, you know, the first winter solstice ritual I did was in 1988. And in June, when it's winter, so when it's winter, so I did a winter solstice ritual in June in Australia, and I never wanted to do Christmas again in Australia, you know. So that was it. (laughs) (laughs) That's really funny. Well, and I could see what, wow, what a disconnect. Because even if you start to dig into, um, Jesus, like the metaphor of Jesus and what he represents. And, you know, if you understand any of what came before, he's the return of the light. <laughs> you know, he's like the light yeah. of the world. You know, I mean, it's, it's quite obvious that there was a, um, yeah. a melding on top of, you know, like taking yeah. these like beautiful. Ancient- and the fact that he had to shed blood, you know, to restore our innocence. What it's like, oh, you yeah. know, the blood of the blood of the goddess is very different. She, you know, she sheds it every day. <laughs> Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, the wheel. So winter solstice is a great place to start, you know, but you know, other people might feel drawn to something else, but, um, or maybe even, you know, spring equinox, you know, it's the East for the Northern hemisphere people. Once again, it's, it's spring equinox, the Easter thing. Yes. Right. At least you can connect them. Yes, you can. Not exactly. They're not exactly in time. Um, but they're pretty close because it's the yeah. first. First, but, You know, once again, if you live in the Southern Hemisphere, you just get driven nuts. You have, you do develop compassion after a while uh, because it's autumn here, you know. Yes. Go- yes, but but in here, Easter is either it's the first. Okay, wait, I'm looking at my moon calendar. Um, <laughs> it's the first full it's the first Sunday after the first full moon after the equinox. So yeah, the can't, spring they equinox. Can't get away from, yeah, they, so I can't get away from her. Well, <laughs> I mean, she kind of worked a good thing out. Like why, you know, <laughs> like this is, this is the way empire works, right? You just take the best parts <laughs> and claim it's yours. Um, yes, that's right. Yes. Yes. Well, um, yes, but getting on board with your children, you know, that's, you back to that and that's good start what what appeals to you and modestly you know it is true I have been privileged to to put on eight parties a year the way I did over decades and it was a huge preparation for each you know uh I'd start three weeks before mm-hmm. meditating, contemplating, getting the decorations out. I've got the most amazing decorations that I've built up over time. But yes, I, so, you know, I was privileged to be able to do that because it does take a lot of time. But you have to just bite off and just do what you can. Make gingerbread snakes. Make yes. Snakes, make cake. And, and there's a, I have a student, and I won't mention her name because I should, but I just love her because she does her grandchildren help. She's she's just started doing the wheel and her grandchildren help her put everything out on the table. So she draws them into, you know, helping her collect the rocks or whatever they need. Yes. And, and so I want to say too, so in Glennis's latest book, um, there's a recipe for snakes, these, these gingerbread snakes that are, um, I can't wait to make and that you give really wonderful. So that is really the, the, the book itself, you're explaining this cosmology, right. But you're also providing what I think is just super valuable information about, um, how to honor these, this turning of the wheel, like ritual and ceremony and things that you can, um, take into your own practice. So it, it's a really, really fascinating and it's just a, it's just a, such a resource. I know I'm going to use it for the rest of my life. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank so if you're looking for a place to start and like really understand what these, you know, in depth, like what each of these points um, means, I would definitely say, you know, 
check out this book. It's super helpful. But, you know, I, I, so I mentioned like, okay, maybe start with one, but is there anything else you would maybe say for people who are wanting to either start or kind of deepen into this, um, this understanding of the cyclical dance of creation that we get to do? Yes. I, I think, um, celebrating the wheel of the year in a way, well, I was able, particularly because I'm in the Southern Hemisphere, to separate myself from the Gregorian calendar. Yes. The Gregorian calendar is a colonization of time, our time space. So to sink into the celebration of her creativity, what's really going on, you know, the solstice is the equinox, so, you know, Earth is moving around the sun. This is our sacred journey every day. Is our, our everyday sacred journey is the earth moving around the sun at a 23 degree angle. So very it's a magic number, 23 <laughs> thereabouts. And it causes the seasons. But to so to operate within that time, that's real time and space. You know, we often hear the word, oh, back to the real world now. Well, actually, <laughs> the real world is this world where her creativity is being manifest all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah I guess I'm, I'm really strong on that about if you know separating yourself from the Gregorian calendar mm -hmm. into real time and space into her time and space I mean I know we have to operate and that's all right you know you've got jobs and we've got all you know we do have things that are happening every day and that's fine but it's just a, a, an awareness the sacred moments of recognizing where we really are and, and of course you do that every day in some way mm -hmm. uh, you can do that in every day but the, yes the, the celebrating the wheel is that for mm -hmm. me mm, I love that and and listeners if you are some of those folks that actually listen when the podcast comes out in case you're not aware of it I don't talk about it a lot but you're doing that uh because this podcast comes out on every full moon and every new moon and that's my practice, at least in part of trying to step away from the Gregorian calendar. I don't know why I don't mention it much. It's funny. I had a friend who uh, listens to the show and she was, she's not on social media. I think I always say it when I put out the the post on social media, like, Hey, happy new moon, happy full moon. And she was like, I didn't even know you were doing this on the full moon and the new moon. I should clearly say that more often. But the reason is that I am trying to align myself in those rhythms as well. Like, um, you know, to pay attention to those turning points. So if you're listening, when this is, you know, the day it's coming out, you're doing it too, whether, whether or not you knew in a small way, you're subverting um, the Gregorian calendar and colonization. So well, well done. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> Very good. Oh, um, Glennis, I thank you so much. I want to um, tell people how they can find you and, um, Yes, that, where they can learn more about you. And I am I have so many notes. You mentioned lots of amazing people. So I'm going to email you afterwards to make sure I got it all, but I'll put all that in the show notes. But yes, can you tell us um, how people can find you and your work? Uh, my website is http pagayan.org. That's P-A-G-A-I-A-N.org. There's my website and there's all kinds of resources there. I know um, Trista has created a uh, Pagayan resources page, the Girl God Books who published uh, the new book, have a yes. Pagan resources page as well. But uh, you can find your way there also through my website. Yes. And um, Trista Hendren, publisher of Girl God Books, has also been a guest on the show. So the connections are endless. Um, it's uh, Glennis, thank you so much for your time. It's been such a joy to be in conversation with you. Thank you, Liz, and, and for all the great work you're doing. That's mm. great. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for listening as always. Um, I'm glad you're here. I always, I, well, I often say this, like uh, I, I would do these conversations even if you weren't here because they fill my cup, but it's way more fun <laughs> knowing that people are listening. Um, if you like this show, you can, uh, you can um, subscribe to it. You can um, give it a favorable review. You can tell all your friends about it. You can do all those things if you feel so inspired and until next time, take very good care of yourself and I will talk to you again soon.